Welcome back to our Busting Addiction and Its Myths podcast. I'm Bruno J, and I have updated the introduction to our episodes in order to address an issue that we cannot ignore, nor do we want to. It looks like COVID-19, the coronavirus, will be with us for some time, some say for another year or two. People are as frightened as they ever have been. They seek safety for their families above all, protection from the virus and from economic insecurity. But many families also face an added burden, drug addiction and alcoholism in their own homes, and what to do about it. There's something you should know. We, Safe House Rehab Thailand, were founded on the idea of safety. We hold on to the truth that clients deserve to come to a treatment clinic where they can at least feel safe and sound. Devoting ourselves to safety first gives us the firm foundation upon which everything else is constructed, hence our name, Safe House Rehab Thailand. Thailand has been recognized as one of the world's safest places to be during the pandemic. Further, we at Safe House have made the right adjustments so that clients and staff remain and feel safe and sound. Masks are mandatory as is social distancing, mandatory hand cleaning, daily blood oximeter readings, which is an early warning measure. And if by chance someone, anyone doesn't feel well, the local hospital in Bang Bung is only minutes away. My podcast, Busting Addiction and Its Myths, is dedicated to serving families of still suffering addicts and alcoholics by providing evidence-based advice and insight so that you can make a better informed decision on what to do and what not to do. We are sponsored by Safe House Rehab Thailand, dedicated to a modern approach to recovery, which means that we absolutely outperform traditional rehabs when it comes to diagnostics, technology, and aftercare. To learn how we can help, just visit safehouserehab.com where we post the latest news or send us an email at contact at safehouserehab.com. Welcome back to Season 4, Episode 9 of our podcast, Busting Addiction and Its Myths. I'm Bruno J, and I would like to call this episode, You're the Addict, Not Me. Allow me to explain. I've spoken in earlier episodes about the idea that the whole family becomes sick when there's an active addict or alcoholic in your midst. Even if the loved one is currently recovering, the disease has done so much damage over the years, yes, years, that it takes a long time, if ever, before its effects are acknowledged and even longer to repair the damage. And some damage lasts a lifetime. An example of that point just now is what happened on my own journey of recovery, which started in 1993, 27 years ago, if you're listening to this in the year 2020. Part of recovery in a 12-step program, and I hasten to add that 12-step programs do not have an exclusive claim on recovery, is to do what is known as a fourth and fifth step, which has us do an autobiography of our lives with a focus on our shortcomings, which cause damage to the people in our lives. The lies, the stealing, the hostility, the unjustified blaming, and so on. This part of the process lays the groundwork for growing up and holding ourselves accountable as sick people, not as bad people. But we're not off the hook at that point by any means. If anyone says to you, oh, those AA people just make excuses for their immoral behavior and messed up lives, the truth is quite the opposite. There's a reason for our behavior, and then there's the need for accountability. The reason is that we were in the grip of a powerful disorder that robbed us of the power of choice. But it isn't an excuse either. That's where accountability comes in. After we acknowledge the wrongs we have done, we literally make a list of the people we have harmed and go forward and make direct amends to all the people we have harmed, a little or a lot. If we have to pay them back, we pay them back, if only a little at a time. If we were unfair or or unkind or neglectful to our families, we acknowledge that. We promise to do better, you know, as the years roll on. We own up to it. We promise to mend our ways. And this time we actually mean it. There are some things that we cannot ever repair, and our teachers in AA wisely acknowledge this truth. One thing I cannot repair is the psychological damage I inflicted on my young daughter with my absences and neglect and the lies I felt I needed to tell while I was drinking and using. My choice of girlfriend who hated my kid and how I didn't stand up for my kid still hurts to think about. My daughter and I have a wonderful relationship today, thanks more to her forgiving nature than to my commitment to be a good, loving father every day, every chance I get. One day years ago, as my daughter and I were discussing our family history, and this is a friendly meeting at the time, 
She said in the most casual way, Dad, of course I'm an ACOA and I've gone to some of those meetings and talked about it to my therapist too. ACOA, well, ACOA stands for Adult Child of an Alcoholic. There are millions of adults who grew up in an alcoholic or drug abusing family and most have no idea that the family disease of addiction and alcoholism has damaged their psyches, has crushed their self-esteem, and has them responding to life in very unhealthy ways. In some cases, the pain caused by their moms or dads or both parents' insane behavior has them seeking refuge in substances which will numb their thoughts and feelings of anger, shame, and desperation. Keep in mind that many of today's addicts started their using careers right under their parents' noses. In other cases, the parents brought their children into a using life by making addictive or drunken behavior totally normal. The after-effects of living in a dysfunctional family include severe codependency, where the adult child feels overly responsible for the behavior of others and becomes easy prey for manipulative people. Then there is the tendency to choose absolutely the wrong partner because the potential partner's behavior is somehow familiar. I happen to agree with the assertion among many experts that ACOAs, adult children of alcoholics, can't recognize normal. So the guy who is behaving more like the woman's drunken father actually might look like the most normal guy in the world to her. It's what she's used to. I used to joke with my daughter that it would be a good idea if she ended up with a man who is the exact opposite of her dad. That digression aside, let's first examine what's likely been happening in your own home or if you've been living, if you've been living with an addict or alcoholic under the same roof or not. For many in my audience at this moment, the question and the quandary that persistently presents itself is this. What can I do? What can my family do to get our loved one turned around? I hate it when I have to say that the short answer is nothing. You are dancing with the devil and you don't even know it. And now you have to detox yourself from the effects of this disease. That's quite a challenge. But here's the irony. The irony is that the more we tried to control our addict loved one's behavior, the more we were drawn into behavior that resembled the very addiction we were vainly trying to vanquish. Perhaps this explains why we call alcoholism a family disease. This disease has caused every aspect of family life to become dysfunctional. dysfunctional. At first in subtle ways, and since the disease is progressive, it always, always, without exception, gets worse. After a few years of torture, the family picture is unrecognizable. Family members end up behaving just like the addict or alcoholic without using alcohol or drugs. The vibe is toxic, trust is non-existent, drama prevails, and resentment rules the house. The main effect of the disease is the introduction and rampant growth of codependency. Codependent behaviors and habits are self-destructive. We are reacting to people who are destroying themselves, and we react by learning how to destroy ourselves. These habits can keep us in destructive relationships that cannot, will not, ever work. These behaviors can also sabotage relationships that may have otherwise have been perfectly healthy and have worked out. I can testify to the fact that my cousin, who was an ACOA, drove away a perfectly nice young man because she tried to control every aspect of his life. That's what he told me, which is typical behavior of someone who grew up in an alcoholic household. They can't help themselves. The reason that I have titled this episode, You're the Addict, Not Me, is simply to call attention to two things. Your addict loved one, if he or she is still using, will throw stuff back in your face, accusing you of the same things he is obviously guilty of, like, you're the addict, and I've witnessed this myself. And he or she will deny, deny they have a problem, and make you the problem because you stand in the way of his or her using or drinking. Twisted but true. What you should start thinking about, if you can relate to any of this, is to make it your mission to take much better care of yourself. I hope that you come to realize that your energy is of little use in trying to change the downward trajectory of your loved one's disease. Now, you have more options than you think. Look up al online and find a beginner's meeting where you will find love and understanding. Connect to a sponsor who will serve as your tour guide th throughout your own recovery. Buy Melody Beatty's book, Go Dependent No More, or Get Love First, a book about intervention by Deborah and Jeff J. Or find yourself a qualified AODA, alcohol or drug addiction counselor. And make sure that the counselor or therapist is specifically trained in addiction. Typical therapists are not qualified to deal with issues of addiction and have been known to give advice that could indeed do harm. It is a scary thing to let go of your loved one. It feels cold and uncaring at the moment when you make the turn to take care of yourself instead of obsessing over the addict. But here's the truth of it. All of the things you were trying to do, your, do for your loved one 
were well-meaning, but they were utterly misguided. You had not yet been educated to the reality of addiction, that you are just as powerless over his addiction as he is. Once you surrender to the simple but essential truth, you begin your journey of liberation. So what did we learn today? One, people in recovery, whether in AA or Al-Anon or other 12-step programs, must hold themselves accountable for their behavior as part of their progress in personal development and healing. Two, the after effects of living in a dysfunctional family include codependency, where the adult child feels overly responsible for the behavior of others and becomes easy prey for manipulative people. Three, the irony is that the more we tried to control our addict loved one's behavior, the more we were drawn into behavior that resembled the very addiction we were vainly trying to vanquish. Four, liberation from the grip of addiction on family members starts with surrender to the truth that the caregiver, the mom or dad, or wife is as powerless over addiction as the addict himself. And five, there is plenty of help available if one is at the point of enough is enough. We caution those seeking help from a professional to make sure that he or she is a qualified AODA practitioner, lest uninformed advice prolong needless suffering. Thank you for tuning in today. It's my fervent hope we've given you new insight and new hope that will lighten your burden where our hearts go out to all who suffer the effects of addictive disorder. Please give us your feedback at info at safehouserehab.com. By all means, ask us any question you like, and we'll answer on air, if you will. And if you want to leave us your first name and city, we'll recognize you too, of course. This podcast is sponsored by safehouserehab.com, where we take a modern approach to recovery, something all families of those who suffer deserve. Tune in next week for more.